Jason, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can. It is a bit. Could you, could you speak again? I think it's a bit low. Uh, yeah, so what I was uh, saying is I'm not able to present my uh, slides. Can you change the settings for that? Uh, yeah, sure. One second. Yeah, uh, just make it like for Lamisa and Isabella as well. Wait, they haven't joined yet. Just change the settings so that everyone can share this time. Yeah, that's done. I think you should be able to share. Cool. I'll just try once. Yeah, we can see your screen.
Hi everyone, um, I'm Ashley and we're going to start in like a few more minutes. So we're waiting for more people to join and uh, as soon as we get a few more people, we're going to start. Thanks. Hello, thank you for joining guys. We'll be starting in four or five minutes once more people join.
Oh, hi, everybody. If you have any friends who would like to join and uh, forgot about this session, you can just call them up or text them and ask them to join really quickly because we're going to start in about two minutes. All right, so we'll begin. So hello, everybody. Uh, I hope you all are doing great. I am Ashley from IGM ISO Pune, and I will be your host for today's webinar, which is the future of synthetic biology. Uh, this webinar will take you through the basics of synthetic biology, which is one of the most exciting fields of research right now. We also have some really fun activities and sessions that our friends from Team HKU and Stony Brook have organized for you all. So without any further delay, I request Vidisha from Team Aisa Pune to take over and help us all learn about this amazing world of synthetic biology. Hello. Yeah, so I hope you all are doing well. Again, uh, my name is Vidisha. I am from Team IGEM Aisa Pune. Oh, and I'll be talking a bit about synthetic biology. So uh, starting off with the... Uh, Jason, can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. So starting off with the pandemic, we all have been watching the pandemic for months now from our homes, <coughs> observing the shortcomings in our healthcare system that prevented efficient handling of the virus. And in our nation, one of those failures was lack of testing availability, which made isolation and contact tracing difficult. There were two main factors that led to the problem with testing. The first is that standard tests require professionals to analyze samples and interpret results. But the thing is, there are very limited people to do so. The second is that testing requires expensive reagents, hardware, and lab equipment. Again, all of those are very limited. And the last is the time that it requires to get results. Normally, it takes around 24 hours to get the results. But what if I tell you that you can get the results in five minutes? So we're going to answer this question by the end of today's talk. Today, we are going to talk about synthetic biology and how it helps in solving important problems in the world. So uh, Jason, can you please go to the next slide? Information. So to begin with today's talk, let us talk about the molecules that are root of synthetic biology, DNA and RNA. So would anyone like to comment on what they know about DNA and RNA? Anyone at all? Like, I, I would really like if this session is interactive rather than me talking for the no, next sorry. half an hour. I, I think DNA stands for the oxidizing acid and sort of has the genetic code for all the protein building and something yes. inside like, like RNA is used for is there many types of RNA which like in combination with DNA due to uh, protein synthesis. Absolutely. So information in DNA is present in form of a code of four letters. So these four letters are basically four molecules ATGC, namely adenine, thymine, guanine and cytosine. So enzymes that are present in the nucleus of the cell, what they do is they export a part of this information to the rest of the cell by converting the DNA information to RNA by the process of transcription. Uh, so in the next slide, you'll be able to see the entire uh, schematic. Yeah. So this is the, so I've talked to transcription. So next thing what happens is this RNA is then exported out of the nucleus and read by enzymes present in the cytoplasm to create proteins, which are molecules that perform a lot of biological functions. So if you think about it, DNA is basically like a cookbook. 
and rna is a particular recipe in that book and proteins are the food that you prepare by following the recipe uh jason next slide so synthetic biology looks at modifying dna in the bacteria or other organism so what do we mean by modifying dna and why do we want to do this the question brings us back to the question that we started off with can we improve the covid testing rate but to answer this question we need to understand some of the tools of synthetic biology and the first tool that we are going to talk about is dna synthesis so i i think a lot of you are familiar with this particular diagram does anyone know what this is anyone who's in 11th 12th grade and has taken science might be aware of that are there any 11th 12th graders here okay so uh, this is the process of dna replication that happens inside the cell so dna replication is basically uh, making another strand of dna from pre existing strand so dna synthesis happens at a specific place on a chromosome that is called as origin so in the first mechanism one daughter strand is initiated at the origin on one parental strand so can you see uh, in this diagram so the lagging there, there are two strands the lagging strand and the leading strand so four requirements for dna synthesis are substrates so your substrate substrates are basically the four nucleotides that we talk about atgc then you require the template the template is the parent strand from which the replication occurs and primers uh, dna primers are enzymes that synthesize dna dna polymerase uh, without primers you cannot add nucleotides to the sequence and the process of replication cannot take place and lastly the last crucial factor for dna replication are enzymes so here the most crucial enzyme is dna polymerase so this is the replication process that happens in vivo that is it happens inside the cell but with the help of synthetic biology artificial gene synthesis can also take place so artificial gene synthesis refers to a group of methods that are used in synthetic biology to construct and assemble genes from nucleotides outside the cell so unlike dna synthesis in living cells i said that you require in living cells i said that you require a template dna right which is the parent strand but for artificial gene synthesis you do not require a a template strand and it allows to sequence any dna in the laboratory so it comprises of two main state steps the first of which is solid phase dna synthesis it's sometimes known as dna printing this produces all oligonucleotide fragments so oligonucleotides are basically a uh, a kind of a clone of nucleotides which are not nucleotides but have a very close resemblance to them that are generally under 200 base pairs the second steps involves connecting these oligonucleotide fragments using various dna assembly methods because the artificial gene synthesis does not require a template dna it is actually possible to make a completely synthetic dna model with no limits on the nucleotide sequence size now coming to the next slide uh, we'll be talking about our second tool which is standard biological path so you all are aware that biological systems are highly complex and due to that level of complexity simply making modifications in the dna and simply cutting and pasting genes from one organism into another might mess up things this is exactly what calls the need for standardization and use of well characterized paths standardization is uh, basically coming up with protocols to guide creation of gene circuit based on a general agreement so gene circuit here you can imagine gene circuit exactly like electrical circuit I, i'll explain more in a while one vision of standard assembly is the concept of bio bricks you can think of bio bricks as legos they are basically the building blocks of synthetic biology they are standard parts that can be put together to form complex systems 
just like how a simple electrical circuits can be made using batteries and resistors genetic circuits can be put together using biobricks these circuits can be inserted into cells to control how they function uh, so did everyone follow till here uh, yeah but i just have one question but i'm wondering if you're taking it right now yeah i can take it right now as well yeah but I, i was just wondering what exactly a biobrick is so biobrick is basically a dna sequence you can see this uh, diagram right in front of you yeah so the promoter the terminators those are biobricks they are dna sequences that are that perform a specific functions and they are like standardized sequences like one particular promoter like lag z for example can be used in different plasmids and can perform various functions so in this way there is no issues of compa compatibility issues like you won't face okay. any compatibility issues if you have a standardized sets of biobricks so biobricks have a set of restriction sites that will allow standard cloning and construction of series of parts from a synthetic gene unit so if all the synthetic biology community uses this standard assembly con convention then you can share all the parts and combine one part with the other without any compatibility issues thank you is, is that clear okay yeah. uh, so moving on to the so now till now we have discussed two concepts one was the central dogma of molecular biology so the entire process of translation transcription is known as central dogma of molecular biology and we also learned about biobricks so now we go towards some advanced concept that is the real life application of synthetic biology uh next slide so first application that we are going to see is metabolic pathway engineering so the concepts of synthetic biology have also been applied to metabolic engineering this involves altering or modifying the natural metabolic pathways in an organism such as e coli or yeast or saccharomyces cerevisiae to produce non natural metabolites so by non natural metabolites i mean the metabolites which are not naturally produced in the organism dur dur during its metabolic cycles or what we can do is shift the balance of synthesis towards a key metabolite of interest so this metabolite may be the final output or it can also be an intermediate that can be easily processed further to get a molecule of choice an important aspect of metabolic engineering is integrating a new pathway into cell and also taking into account the pre existing or the native metabolite and pathway operation that are necessary for maintenance of essential cell functions so this particular method is extremely important for cheaper and sustainable manufacturing of industrially relevant metabolites pharmaceutical drugs important chemicals and even biofuels so to make this clear i'll i'll give you one actual example uh, jason can you go to the next slide please yeah so this particular uh, diagram that you can see in front of you is the e coli uh, is the ethanol synthesis in e coli so if you can look closely there is this gene called adhe which is producing ethanol in e coli so what you can do is you can block all the other pathways and you can direct the entire influx towards ethanol production that is you can just knock out ldha and and the gene below that and you can over express adhe to get ethanol so how is this over expression or deletion done so the thing is it's not just a bio brick that plays a role in the entire process regulation of gene expression involves a lot of mechanisms other than this that are usually used by cells to increase or decrease the production of specific gene products so in this case our uh, desired gene product is ethanol so they do this by controlling the rate of quantity of products there could be many other things that could be influ that could influence the rate of gene expression that includes light ph temperature or even presence of certain chemicals or certain alcohols or that or there's this chemical called iptg so what synthetic biologists do is they take advantage of these mechanisms to slow or speed up the production of items that they require so basically they can 
change these parameters and over express the ethanol producing gene because of which you will get more output of ethanol so that like that is the example like we can use genetically modified organism to produce a chemical on an industrial scale so this is not only like environmentally friendly but this will also help you to produce industrially relevant metabolite at a way cheaper price so moving on to the next part a second example that we are going to talk about is biosensors so biosensors are devices which combine a biological component to detect a chemical and a physiological component to produce a signal which is measurable so any biosensor is functionally composed of three components the biological element which is responsible for detecting chemicals and generating a response signal forms the first part the signal generated by the biological element is then transformed into a detectable response by the second component which is called as transducer which is the most critical component in any biosensing device the third part is of the biosensor is a detector which amplifies and processes the signals before displaying it using an electronic display system so in this in this particular diagram you can see the various steps of processing in a biosensor so an early example uh, jason can you please go to our next slide so an early example of biosensor was introduced in 1962 and that was to monitor the blood gas level during surgery and in today's world the most common biosensors are home pregnancy tests and glucose detectors however there is a drive to produce new biosensors for a wide range of applications using food analysis dna testing and drug detection so now that we have learned about the central dogma biobricks and these two examples we will come back to the question that we had asked in the beginning about improving the rate of covid testing uh, jason can you go to the next slide please yeah so this is our final slide so the issue of rapid covid testing was something that one of the igm teams in 2020 from stanford worked on so what they did was they made a self replicating test kit powered by sugar water and air so as i said the covid test kits that are available right now are expensive and they are not reproducible you cannot use them everywhere you need special equipments to use them but this particular test kit was made and it requires only sugar water and air to function what they did that was they used this one microbe called bacillus subtilis which is a very robust microorganism and it has the ability to naturally take up nucleic acid from environment it can actually take up dna and rna from the environment so what they did was they engineered this bacillus subtilis to search for any specific nucleic acid sequence like you you'll have to give it a give some nucleic acid sequence and it will rec it will recognize that so what exactly happens is this particular microorganism can convert a double stranded dna into a single stranded dna and this single stranded dna is the one that activates the reporter system that is designed by this particular team so so it can be activated by two synthetic biology tools called to hold and homologous recombination you can read about it more i'll share the wiki of this particular team on chat in a while so with help of this kit so in the in the plasmid like we saw a plasmid right when we were talking about standardized biological parts so there we saw so here in this they have fixed a bio brick for yellow fluorescent protein bfp so what happens is whenever you put a sequence in this so there is al already a pre existing sequence inside the bacteria and when you add a new sequence and the both the sequence match you can see a fluorescence you can see a light coming out of the detector so that is how you can make a testing kit which is like very cheap it is reproducible and it is easily accessible 
So I will now request Ashley to go forward and discuss about IGM. So now we have talked about IGM. Uh, I'll now request Ashley to take over and introduce Ramisa. Right. So thanks a lot, Vidisha. That was a great presentation. And uh, being a person with a terrible attention span myself, I can really proudly say that I was hooked to uh, the session. So I really liked the idea about the uh, the idea of the COVID testing kit that you were talking about and how students all around the world have this really good opportunity to come forward and participate in a competition called IGM to solve real world problems. So with this, I invite Lamisa from Team Stony Brook to give us all a small introduction to this world of IGM. Hi everyone, um, I'm Lamisa from the Stony Brook iGEM team and let me share my screen. Um, oh, give me one sec. And while I'm sharing, oh, hang on, thing, I'm going to turn my camera off if that's okay, just to preserve my internet connection, which has been very glitchy today. Um, all right. Can everyone see the screen? All right, perfect. So yeah, we can see. Yeah. What is iGEM? So we've talked about iGEM a lot, and you probably heard this word several times by now. So I'll give you a quick introduction uh, to what this is and what we do in iGEM. So iGEM stands for Internationally Genetically Engineered Machine, iGEM. Um, and it's basically an international nonprofit research competition where students can develop projects that uh, propose synthetic biology solutions to real life problems. Um, so why synthetic biology? Because usually synthetic biology solutions are cheaper and more sustainable than the current solutions that we have to these problems that we're trying to solve. Um, and this can be in many topics, including therapeutics. So that might be, um, you know, uh, creating new medicine or altering a pathway um, that already exists in a system um, to cure a disease or detect a disease or anything like that. There's also environmentalism. So this might be um, developing, you know, bioreactors or some sort of system that detoxifies toxins um, from the air, from the water, um, or solving some other issues such as carbon capture. Um, biofuel, um, self-explanatory, using synthetic biology or microbes to generate um, alternative energy sources. Um, and there's many, many more. And all iGEM 2020 teams, so this is last year's one, there's 249 teams in total. And I believe this number has grown um, for this year's registered teams. And we're from all over the country. Um, so, you know, there are teams from almost every single continent. And one of the best parts of iGEM is getting to know these people and being able to collaborate and work with people from all over the world and kind of dealing with time zone conflicts, which is always fun. Um, and at the end um, of the competition, iGEM teams basically present their work um, at the Giant Jamboree where we have judges and you present what work you've done, um, if your project was successful in genetically modifying whatever system you're trying to modify, um, and why your solution is better than current solutions that we have right now. Um, and through this, teams can earn either bronze, silver, or gold, and many other um, awards um, at the event. Um, and teams can be at the level of high school. So they're high school teams. They're also undergraduate teams. Um, and there's also overgraduate teams, so master's students and PhD students. So there's a wide array of different people with different backgrounds um, in iGEM. Oops, sorry. Let me mute myself for a second. Sorry about that. So what do we do at iGEM? What is the actual project that we're uh, doing? So iGEM consists of three major components. So we have wet lab, we have dry lab, and we have outreach. Um, and although um, you know students may be involved in several different um, of these groups at once, um, usually work is kind of divided among which team you fall into. 
So what is Wet Lab? Wet Lab is involved with the actual project development, um, which is a team effort, but Wet Lab is the main person who's designing the project and designing the steps of experimentation. So before we start, obviously, we have to do a lot of research, lots of reading articles, reviewing articles, also talking to experts in the field to come up with a project. And then it comes to construct design. So construct design is actually designing what genes you're going to be adding on with what sort of backbone, um, your uh, experimental design, all that stuff. And then we have the actual experimentation. Um, so, you know, uh, transforming our bacteria with the gene that we want, seeing if it successfully um, does what it's supposed to, um, and so on. Oh. Sorry, okay. So yeah, research finding applications of theoretical ideas, getting ideas reviewed, and then experiment is putting everything into practice, seeing if ideas work or if a different approach is needed. So there's a lot of troubleshooting that's also involved in experimentation um, because things don't go always, things don't always go the way you want it to go. And then we have Dry Lab. So Dry Lab has web design. So all teams, all iGEM teams actually have a wiki page, um, which is one of the things that um, judges look at. Um, so we have to code a wiki which goes in depth about our team project, um, how we came up with the project, um, what we did during the project, um, all the dry lab aspects, wet lab outreach, everything, and um, just an overview of who our team is and what we do. Um, there's also the modeling aspect. So this is uh, developing curves or visual models um, through programming and simulations um, and mathematical analysis to either show um, predictions of how our experiment is going to run. It could be protein-protein interaction that we're modeling. Um, for example, for our team, we have um, a bioreactor. So it's kind of simulating how that biofilter would be able to degrade um, water that contains toxin. Um, so yeah, and we use many different softwares such as J, Amber, and so many more. And then we have outreach. So outreach is a huge component of iGEM. So iGEM is not just about the science. It's not about just STEM. It's also about reaching out to your community and educating people. And outreach is actually one of the main components that's created um, during the giant jamboree. So what does outreach mean? So it means to present and collaborate with companies, other teams, schools, and local communities. So it could be um, the government that you're communicating with, um, the high schools that you went to, your university, um, and companies that might be interested in your project. Um, so the part of uh, the point of outreach is to raise awareness for the issue that we're dealing with and also to educate students on synthetic biology and other aspects of iGEM. It also involves fundraising um, to conduct the research that we're trying to conduct um, and also connecting with professors to improve upon your research. So that's kind of mentioned over here, human practices. So human practices is a huge component of outreach, which is just raising awareness um, and bringing together our community to find these creative solutions. And then there's also integrative human practices, which actually involves you know, talking to experts, like I said before. Um, it could be other researchers in your field, or it could be companies to improve our project um, from where we started. Um, so yeah. And then before I move on, oh, wait, I thought I think that was it. So yeah, that's pretty much what iGEM is. Does anyone have any questions or want to know more about a certain aspect? Uh, I have a question related to like high school, high school that participate in iGEM because like speaking as a high school student, I can't imagine like how they do it. So if you know, like, like what kind of students will participate and which level are they at? Like it might be slightly unrelated, but if you do, you do. Can you repeat that one more time? Sorry, I cut out for a little bit. For yeah. Me. So you also you you also mentioned that high school students and teens participate in them. So like I just wanted to know like and at what level they usually are because to me it's slightly like difficult to comprehend that high school students actually do this stuff because I find that really yeah yeah um I know our team is actually collaborating collaborating with another high school team and 
they're pretty much at the same level that we are at. Um, so, you know, they have students all the way from, I think, ninth grade to seniors, like 12th grade. Um, and, you know, it's a team effort. So there might be one person who's very like, they have a lot of knowledge on synthetic biology. And then you also have the people who are good at outreach and dry lab. So you kind of bring everyone together and they're able to create, you know, these solutions and synthetic biology projects. Um, I do know that they um, get mentorship from some undergraduate teams um, and also professors and um, iGEM teams have advisors. So um, experts or, you know, other teachers or scientists who know about synthetic biology, helping them out. Um, so yeah, their projects are just as great as undergrad and even overgrad, yeah. Oh, thanks. No problem. All right, that was an excellent presentation, Lamisa. And uh, I was thinking while you were giving the presentation that I might end up participating next year as well, after all the nice and wonderful things that you talked about. So I hope our audience is as excited about IGM as we are. That's, that's the plan. So uh, I was wondering how amazing it is that we can engineer microbes like that and make them whatever, like make them do whatever we want them to do. And here are my friends who won't even get me a glass of water. <laughs> I wish I could ask my friends to do that for me. But uh, jokes aside, we have Isabella from Team HQ to help us learn more about these microbes and the advanced research that has been going on in them. So over to you, Isabella. Oh, thank you. Let me just share my screen first. All right, so hi everyone. My name is Isabella and I come from the University of Hong Kong. And today basically I wanna talk about microbes which play a very important part in synthetic biology and how they um, bring us uh, both positive and negative impacts in society. So our agenda today is I wanna discuss what microbes are, what microbes do, and its role in synthetic biology, as well as some recent advancements uh, that we see from scientists. All right, so what are microbes and what do they do? Does, can anyone, you can just unmute yourselves, feel free to voice out what you think they are. That is another form of life day, which often get used in yeah, that's that's actually uh, pretty accurate. Um, all right, so actually uh, microbes are microscopic single-celled organisms, and they're so small that you can't see them with the naked eye, but you need the help of a microscope to see them. And so you can practically find them anywhere, perhaps on the desk that you're working on right now, in the air, soil, water, animals and even our body and one fun fact about them is that actually we have more bacteria which is a form of microbes in our mouth than the number of people on earth i think that's pretty shocking and so the four common types of microbes are uh, bacteria um, virus fungi but also protists as you can see um, they differ in a their size, um, shape, form, and also like ex uh, internal and extra uh, external characteristics. So let me quickly introduce you to all of them. So bacteria is a single cell organism and there are good and bad bacteria. So if you don't know like the good bacteria, you can commonly find in cheese, um, milk and yogurt. So like dairy products and the bad bacteria as you know, all know, is the one that um, makes us sick. And usually they source their food in the surrounding environment. And oppositely, um, viruses, actually, all of them are bad, just like the COVID-19 virus. And how they behave is as a parasite. So they require a living host that's um, living and breathing that would supply them the nutrients. And so virus depend on um, humans. 
um, or like animals and organisms to live. And so if the host is not alive, the virus um, doesn't really do anything and they are a hundred times smaller than bacteria. As for fungi, um, most common ones are mold and yeast and mushrooms as well. And one of the most well-known ones are, is baker's yeast, which you, you, which you use, like they produce um, certain chemical, uh, like they produce yeast that you use to make bread. And as for protist, um, they're a little bit different from like fungi, bacteria, and virus because protist, um, they have many different kinds and it's very difficult to classify them. So here we have um, protozoans, which means um, animal-like. And one of the examples is amoeba. And then we have um, protophyta protist, which, um, plant, which are plant-like, like they behave like plants or share similar characteristics to plants. And one of the examples is algae. All right, so um, this is quite especially relevant right now. We like often associate microbes to like diseases like COVID-19 and bacterial infections, but actually what good can microbes do? Um, if you know of any examples or uh, daily life occurrences, feel free to unmute yourself or type in the chat. A small hint is that we do have quite a lot of good bacteria. Uh, no. All right, it's fine. I can just go on because I will also address this. So actually microbes have many benefits and it's not limited to uh, like uh, producing like food like cheese, but also it's important in bodily functions, maintaining ecosystems because we need to balance some of the um, stakeholders in the environment. and. It's quite important for agriculture as well. As you can imagine, for crops, um, they do depend on bacteria to survive. And as well as um, they highly uh, impact the utility supply that we have, for example, uh, water and energy. And there are so many more um, benefits of microbes that we can have in many different sectors, but these are just uh, a few and um, the biggest ones. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, bacteria like microbes help maintain the human body. Um, they help digest food in our small intestines. Um, as you can imagine, uh, as uh, we don't, we might not produce all the enzymes that are necessary to break down the foods that we eat. Uh, for example, like the cellulose in um, vegetables, we actually don't have any mechanism to digest it. So we have bacteria in our intestines that do so. And uh, like the balance of these bacteria actually help prevent invasion against uh, of the harmful microbes that can cause like diseases like stomach aches, stomach ulcers and illnesses, All right? And then as for the nature side of things, it helps break down dead plants and animals into useful nutrients for like, uh, like plants and animals that are alive. So here we, we, we see like the nitrogen cycle. Um, on the left, there is um, nitrogen fixing bacteria and they act uh, actually absorb the nitrogen in the atmosphere um, that can be um, directly used by the plant itself if they have root nodules or they will convert it into ammonium, which uh, will be converted into nitrates by nitrifying bacteria. And what these nitrates do, they are actually very, very important and essential uh, nutrients for plants to grow. So um, without nitrates, um, I think uh, the leaves of the plants would be yellow and they would have poor growth. And it's not only... Um, like microbes are not only uh, having a positive impact on plants, 
uh, through like the nitrogen cycle before, but it also helps um, like agriculture in the sense that perhaps um, like farmers want to increase their crop, crop yield and protect them as well. And in terms of crop yield, it would be, for example, there's um, scientists who discovered that um, adding uh, bacteria that is tolerant to salt into the plants uh, would also um, protect them from very um, salty um, water or environment. And so it would help the crops grow. And because of this, you can easily apply it to like um, livestock as well to improve their health growth and also feed uh, utilization. On top of that, uh, microbes is very, very important for a uh, clean water supply. Um, on one aspect, it's for us, like uh, the water you use to shower with. So when they're in the wastewater treatment plants, uh, some bacteria are added, which turn convert the toxic substances into um, they degrade the toxic substances and they will produce energy from that. And the energy that they produce, they will use it for themselves to continue um, de de degrading those toxic substances you find in water. And so it's kind of like a chain reaction and the effect of um, cleaning the water from toxic substances increases. And the same case for um, aquaculture, which is like artificial farming out in the sea. And so they can optimize the water quality, as I said before, about the toxic substances, but perhaps you can also like engineer um, bacteria that can produce certain nutrients that are important for the fish. All right, so as I said earlier, microbes um, have a very, very important role in synthetic biology. And perhaps without them, we wouldn't have um, the capability to create so many interesting um, designs that uh, help uh, the life and environment. And so why we use them is actually because um, microbes like bacteria have a very, very simple genome um, to manipulate. As you can imagine, uh, like humans, we have millions upon millions of uh, nucleotides, which is the um, b basic unit of DNA, while bacteria can range from uh, a couple of hundred to a couple of thousand only. And as you can imagine, that is much more um, practical to do so. And bacteria is easy to maintain because we keep them on like an agar plate. And so uh, once you like culture them and you grow them, you can um, take it from the existing um, plate, transfer it to a new one and they will grow on there. So, and they only need uh, like a medium which has uh, some nutrients that are very accessible. And with synthetic biology, we often have to like test our um, designs. And most of the time, um, it's very easy to fail. Maybe something goes wrong uh, in our design or like the execution. And so you really need to have um, bacteria culture ready um, to uh, continue with your um, like project or uh, research. All right, so one thing common about um, the teens here today, which is uh, I'm from the University of Hong Kong, Stony Brook and Isopune is that we use cyanobacteria in our iGEM projects. And what it is, is actually a photosynthetic bacteria. And basically how we, how plants use, how we use respiration to breathe, this bacteria uses photosynthesis to breathe. So it's their uh, kind of life support system. And usually in synthetic biology, we manipulate them to convert carbon dioxide into higher value products. And that includes like biofuels um, for, uh, to replace like diesel and uh, to replace diesel fuels and biomass to create uh, renewable energy and as well as chemical precursors, which are um, like molecules or compounds that you create from cyanobacteria which can be inserted into like the third or the fourth step of a certain 
a production cycle. So it really uh, cuts the time. And as well as some other nutritional products, uh, which has definitely more room um, for innovation. And because uh, it's a photosynthetic bacteria and it only uses sunlight as its main energy source, we call it environmentally friendly, as opposed to like using power supply, which also um, involves <laughs> non-renewable electricity generation. And it's also economical, as I said earlier, bacteria is easy to produce, it's easy to maintain because you only need the nutrient medium. All right, so I just wanna introduce more about cyanobacteria um, by using our project as an example. So what we do here is um, we're engineering E. coli to degrade PET plastic, which is like what water bottles are made of, um, to so like E. coli to produce petase and metase enzymes to turn it into monomers. And actually these monomers, you can use them to create bioplastics again. And um, yeah, so the role of cyanobacteria here is for them to produce sucrose with, because of photosynthesis, they produce the sugar and we engineer them to release the sucrose. And so E. coli can absorb them. And Basically, this energy source that we're giving to the E. coli is only created by the sunlight, right? So that makes it a system that is um, sustainable. Yeah. Okay. So other than like the environment, which I've just talked about, microbes are also important in healthcare, more particularly for drug delivery systems, because, you know, chem like chemotherapy, it's, or like ra radiotherapy, it's all only... Uh, it's not targeted. So it's like um, there's a risk that you also damage um, cells that are not uh, cancerous. And so that's why synth using synthetic biology, we're always looking for something that has less off-target effects, but also for drug synthesis, because it's more uh, economical, um, efficient, and sustainable because you don't source perhaps some of the um, ingredients from non-renewable um, sources. So one example of the drug delivery system is the cancer drugs delivery by these types of bacteria, the E. coli, which is very common, Bacillus subtilis, and Salmonella. And as you can see here, the picture on the left, um, the drugs are inside or on the bacteria. And on the surface of these bacteria, actually you have some proteins which will recognize the tumor cells. And once they attach to like those tumor cells, they have some mechanism that breaks, um, that uh, releases these uh, drugs and it would attach directly to the tumor cells. And so that's a kind of um, how you minimize the off-target effects of uh, cancer therapeutic drugs. And so you increase the efficiency and yeah. So just to sum up, um, basically the possibilities for synthetic biology are endless with the help of microbes. As I mentioned earlier, how it affects um, like agriculture, our body function, um, and most importantly for um, drug therapeutics. And it's not only for cancer, there are also um, other illnesses or like genetic um, illnesses like uh, infections or genetic disorders that can be treated with synthetic biology and the help of microbes. Yeah. So that's it for my presentation. I hope you learned a lot about how microbes help um, make uh, our lives better. So if there's any questions, feel free to contact us through our Instagram or our email. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Isabella. It was a super fun presentation. And learning new things about such tiny organisms has never stopped fascinating me. So I hope our audience feels the same. And with this, we come to our final segment in the form of a fun activity called Guess the Scientist. Uh, I again invite Lamisa to take over from here. Awesome. Okay. Um, All right, so this is going to be a very interactive presentation. So 
if you could either you know unmute and answer questions as we go along or if you can use the chat function um, to just put in your guesses that would be great um, let me just open my chat as well so that i can see that um, all right so we're going to play a game called guess a scientist um, the purpose of this game is to kind of introduce you to some of the leading founders and um, some of the scientists who have advanced the field of biology, synthetic biology and microbial biology um, to let us do all the research that we're doing right now. Um, synthetic biology has come a long way in like the past 20 years or so, you know, even high school teams and undergraduate teams have this ability and chance to genetically modify organisms and actually use it, which is very mind boggling that we have come so far that it's so, you know, cheap. Um, and easy to do so. So we're just gonna go through some of the scientists. I'm gonna give you some facts about these scientists um, and the purpose is for you to guess who they are. Um, please don't use Google or anything because that'd be super easy and defeat the purpose um, of this discussion and game. All right, let's get started. Oh, why is it not going to the next slide? All right, there we go. All right, number one. So we have six scientists and try to keep count of how many you guess and what type of scientists you're guessing um, for the end. All right, so our first scientist is a German scientist who was born in 1822. Um, they're famous for their pea plant experiment. So that should give you a big hint. All right, y'all got it already, nice job. Um, I'll keep going. Um, he's known as the father of modern genetics for his work in heredity and fundamental laws of inheritance. Um, and some of his um, laws include the law of segregation, independent source, uh, sorry, independent assortment and dominance. And then um, unfortunately he had severe illnesses which caused him to fail um, exams to become um, a professor, which was his dream job. Um, which is how then he went on to focus so much of his time on his research. All right, so you guys already guessed this. So I'll go to the next slide. Yes, yeah, so it is Gregor Mendel. Um, his pea plant experiment took him eight years to complete. And during that time, he kept track of over 10,000 pea plants that he grew and tracked by hand. Um, However, um, as many of you may know, his work was not appreciated during his time. And unfortunately, it wasn't until the 19th century where people gave his research credibility um, because, you know, the time and region he was in was very religious um, and they weren't very keen on the idea of genetics. Um, and something to motivate everyone, he actually suffered depression um, and had a bunch of other severe illnesses, which led to a lot of um, setbacks in life, but he kept continuing on and he, uh, he was unstoppable. Mendel's uh, dedication is admirable, as Isabella said. Um, and his work is what founded, you know, modern um, genetics. So thanks to him. All right, next one. Number two. So this is a biophysicist uh, born in 1920. They discovered the density and helical structure of DNA through X-ray diffraction. And they actually died of cancer at the age of 37, which um, may have hindered, uh, sorry, which may have been due to exposure to radiation. Um, if they had lived longer, they may have won two Nobel prizes for their work. Um, and. Uh, Something that they're known for um, is photograph 51. So that's that's a huge hint at the end. Yes, frankly, awesome. I thought this was going to trick you guys, but all right, I'll go to the next slide. So I'm very glad that you guys guessed um, Rosalind Franklin. Um, lots of times people will guess Watson and Crick when they hear a helical structure of DNA. Um, so yeah, Rosalind Franklin actually faced a lot of struggles in the biology industry because of her gender. Um, back in her time, women weren't actually considered full members of Cambridge University, which is where she got her degree um, in chemistry. And it was seven years after earning her degree that she was actually finally considered a full member. And um, that basically forced Cambridge to acknowledge her scholastic achievement. And throughout her career, she was looked down upon and not taken seriously by her male colleagues. 
who basically didn't consider her as their equal. And she even had to fight in order to attend university um, in the first place due to her gender. And um, as you may know, Watson and Crick, um, they're known for the discovery of the double helix structure um, and they received the Nobel Prize. Um, but actually there's a lot of controversy with that um, since their, their research was based on a paper of her X-ray diffraction work, which kind of showed the structure of DNA. Um, so yeah, had she been alive, she may have shared the Nobel Prize for discovery of the double helix of DNA along with Watson and Crick and also for the 1982 Nobel Prize received by um, her colleague, Aaron Klug, for their shared work on virology. Um, all right. Number three. So this is an English naturalist, geologist, and biologist who was born in 1809, so a very long time ago. Um, and they're considered the father of evolution. Yes, everyone already got it, Charles Darwin, okay. Um, they are famous for their work on natural selection after a voyage that they went on around the world. And um, they are known for the book on the origin of species. Yes, everyone already got it, yay. Okay, so Charles Darwin, as you may know, um, his, uh, he founded you know, evolution um, and his voyage around the world actually lasted five years. Um, and he had a lot of seasickness during the time. Um, but he kept going um, and he visited several continents and countries, um, including South Africa, Brazil, New Zealand, Australia, and many more where he studied different organisms, um, different animals. He uh, jotted down information, um, descriptions of them and kind of saw the world um, as a naturalist. Um, and from that, he published his works on evolution. Um, all right. That one was easy. All right. Number four. All right. So this is a marine biologist and environment, uh, environmentalist, um, and they're considered one of the founders of environmental science. Um, they were one of the first to point out dangers of pesticides, specifically DDT, um, which was subsequently banned in the US um, because of the harm it causes um, to the environment. And they were awarded uh, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, sorry, Medal of Freedom in 1980. And they're known for the book Silent Spring. This is a little bit harder. Does anyone know or have an idea? Yeah, I've heard of this book, Silent Spring, but yeah, I can't recall. What was that? I, I recall, like, I've heard of the name Silent Spring, the book, but I can't recall the person. Close, close. Okay, does anyone have any guesses? All right, I'll move on. Let's see who it is. It is Rachel Carson. Um, has anyone ever heard of Rachel Carson before? Or does the name sound kind of familiar to you? Somewhat, yeah. Somewhat, okay. All right, yeah, a lot of people are saying not familiar. So. She was actually a very sensational author um, with, she published a lot of books. Um, Silent Spring is the most well-known and then The Sea Around Us. And she also faced a lot of criticism from the chemistry industry due to Silent Spring because it kind of fertilizers and like pesticides and all that were heavily used um, in the past. And her book kind of came out, was like pointing out all the dangers. And by that time it was a very, um, like it was heavily used by companies, production, all that. Um, however, she stood her ground and even spoke in front of Senate to advocate for the dangers of pesticides um, in the US, which led to a lot of regulations that we see um, today. So yeah, very influential, uh, influential person. All right, number five. Uh, okay. So this is a biochemist and they won a Nobel Prize in 2020 Oh, wow. Okay, people already got it with Emanuela uh, Charpentier um, for their work in CRISPR-Cas9. Um, they're also known for a first x-ray structure of um, the catalytic DNA and work on RNAi. Um, and they have also won um, other prizes, um, such as the Gerber Prize in genetics and several more. And now they are a professor of biochemistry and molecular biology at University of California. So one person has guessed it. 
So I'll go to the next one, Jennifer Dona. So did, um, is there anyone here who've never heard of her or didn't know about her? You can put it in the chat. I'm going to assume so since we only got one response, um, but she's actually um, one of the founders of CRISPR-Cas9, which you may know, very, very, very heavily used in synthetic biology and has you know, exponentially advance what we can do um, in terms of genetic engineering of um, strands of DNA and um, bacteria and microbes. So um, her work like absolutely revolutionized the world of genetics and it was, um, it has made genetic engineering far more accurate and much, much cheaper, opening the world to curing genetic diseases and modifying organisms and solving issues created by climate change. So thanks to her, we can do so much now. Um, um, all right, next one. So number six, this is the last one. Um, so this is a Scottish physician and a microbiologist was born in 1881. And they're known for the discovery of penicillin. That should give you a big hint as to who this is, um, which was the first antibiotic. Um, they also discovered enzyme lysozyme, which basically it basically breaks down the um, cell wall of bacteria, um, which makes it easier for extraction of different things. Um, and they won a Nobel Prize in 1945 um, in physiology and medicine and has published several like high volumes of research papers on bacteria, um, sorry, uh, immune system and medicine. Yes, it is Alexander Fleming, nice guess. Awesome. So Alexander Fleming discovered antibiotic properties of penicillin um, when basically he was working with all these bacteria and actually he left a Petri dish uncovered. Um, and during that time, he noticed that it was growing mold, but all the bacteria surrounding the uh, mold was dying. It was being killed. Um, so the mold was then isolated and, and named penicillin. Um, and it has, you know, the properties of an antibiotic. It can kill other bacteria. Um, so yes, that was all. Um, I do want to say something about closing discussions. So um, I won't ask you, but I want you to think about, you know, how many of these scientists were you able to guess? Were you able to guess more male scientists versus female scientists or the other way around? Um, I know that, you know, knowledge is very important and we love learning about synthetic biology, um, how everything works, but it's also very important to acknowledge the people um, who have made advances in, you know, this field and has made it available for us to work on these things, um, especially, you know, in science, there's a lot of controversy sometimes of people not getting credit for their work and other people receiving credit. Um, so it's very important to kind of also look at who made these advancements and you know who was behind it all. Um, I know for a lot of the classes I take, um, you know, professors often they there are professors who will just teach us the content, and then we also have professors who will actually um, after every lecture kind of show us who discovered this um, and give credit to those people. Um, so yeah, um, those are some things to consider. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for listening. I'm going to stop sharing now. Thanks a lot, Lamisa. That was a great learning experience. Uh, at least all of us learned about Rachel Carson, which is, and like other great scientists, which is really good. So I think with this, uh, we come to an end to our webinar and we really hope you all learned something new today. And we'll be sending out a feedback form link in the chat box. I'll just paste it. And uh, please see, feel free to uh, tell us and let us know about your experience today. And also, um, don't forget to register for a new certificate through the same form. Uh, thank you all for joining. Stay safe and keep learning. I'll just post the feedback form link in the chat box. Um, uh, hey, uh, Ashley. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm Arjun. I'm I'm the one who's been testing your team on Instagram because I've been wanting to speak to you guys. So could you guys like give me a number or something? Because it may be that you don't check Instagram as often. And I definitely like to talk to you guys about what you're doing. Yeah, of course. Um, I'll give you my email ID and I'll send you my number. Like, could you give me your email ID? I'll send you my number. Yeah, I'll, I'll drop it down in the chat.
Thanks a lot. Cool. No problem. Uh, I've sent the feedback form link. Uh, so you guys could, it would be great if you all could give us your feedback. Okay, I've copied your. Okay. Have you received my email ID? Yes, I have okay. received it. I've noted it now. Thanks a lot, Adam. It was great having you. Really nicely interacting with all of us. It was great to have you as an well. Thank you for the webinar. Thanks a lot to other people as well. Uh, bye. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a nice right. or a night. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye.